Hey, welcome to episode 26 of The Breakthrough Creative. I'm so glad that you're back with us. My name is John and I'm your host. And this is the place where we talk about the business of art and the art of business. Uh, we are getting into October and I thought, man, it would be so cool if we could do an effects-laden October series. And so I went about looking for guests and I found some amazing uh, Hollywood artists and designers, people who work in the movies and uh, in animation and even into uh, games and whatnot. And that sums up uh, much of my guests' work today. Uh, my guest today is Carlos Wante. Carlos is an incredible conceptual designer and illustrator, and he primarily works as a creature designer. He's worked on uh, Prometheus with Ridley Scott. He has worked on the upcoming Dune movie that should be out soon, depending on COVID. He has worked on It, The Clown and It, and the many incarnations of The Clown. He worked on The Aliens and Arrival. He's worked on Goosebumps, Hellboy, War of the Worlds, the Spielberg version, Signs, Men in Black 1 and 2. And it's interesting because he's worked uh, in the practical effects world uh, with Rick Baker and Rob Bottin and all of these incredible practical effects studios. And then in the 2000s, he jumped to the visual effects realm and he worked up at ILM for a while. And so he's worked with practical guys, he's worked with digital guys, and uh, he's even moved into the uh, video game industry as well. And Carlos is just a cool guy who actually got his start in the world of animation. He worked on Alvin and the Chipmunks and the real Ghostbusters, among a, a bunch of others. And he's a, a pretty confident, competent, bold character. And we're going to hear uh, some of his journey today. So I'm going to hand it over to Carlos. It's good to see you, man. I, I want to run down just a little bit of, of the list of your credits. Um, you know, very recently, uh, Netflix has has released The Old Guard and Warrior Nun, and he's yeah. done conceptual design on both of those. He's worked on Pokemon, uh, the recent Godzilla King of the Monsters movie, um, Fantastic Beasts, Blade Runner 2049, Alien Covenant, Prometheus. He's worked with Ridley Scott. He's worked with Steven Spielberg. He's worked with Rick Baker and Rob Bottin, and, and on it goes. So... So, like, it just, the list goes on and on and on. You, there's probably nobody out there listening to this or watching this who hasn't seen some of Carlos's work. So, I, uh, I'm, I'm jazzed. So, thanks again for being here, Carlos, and making the time. And no, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Now that I've said all that, <laughs> will you tell us what you do? Uh, well, you said it. I'm a creature designer, really. Uh, I design living things because the creature design kind of is kind of limited in what it is, but I design anything that's living for entertainment, uh, film and games. Now games is becoming a big thing and TV is now becoming a thing uh, where it wasn't before. Uh, now be thanks to Netflix and Amazon and Apple. Um, it's, you know, so it's all entertainment now, uh, but living things. Yes. Uh, once in a great while, it'll be an environment because it applies to the character. Uh, it helps me to um, talk about the character uh, visually so the client can understand the idea, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, living things. How how did you get started? Like like, did you know you wanted to be a creature designer from an early age or did you just know you wanted to be an artist? How did, what, what transpired to, to get all this going for you well yeah I was always interested in all of this that I do now I mean all the way back um, probably like every kid really every kid is really interested uh, maybe not every kid but most kids are uh, interested in monster movies and you know you just watch them and you love them you're a kid you're a little boy anyways uh, I can only speak from that perspective um, 
that, you know, and I loved it. You know, I, I just loved it and I, I drew. But I also played, you know, music growing up. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew it was going to be something and I, uh, to do with either music or drawing. But I, all, I was very interested in um, science also. So all these things were battling. You know, they were fighting to see who was going to end up, you know, first in first place, you know, because I was going after all of it equally through grammar school and up into high school. Things started to focus, even though I was playing in rock bands, marching band, you know, drum squad leader, uh, all that sort of thing. But then I, I started drawing uh, and putting my artwork into the art shows and I saw people reacting to it. And immediately my work was being kind of put up, you know, in a higher place. Uh, and I knew that I knew that I knew how to do it, but I didn't know if it was really as great as, you know, you think it is, <laughs> you know, so, but when you see people reacting to it, you start to, you know, get, start to get your first real, um, I don't know if how to, you know, you get your first real uh, idea of what it, uh, what its value is, you know, what the work is worth uh, by seeing people, even though these people probably have no education in art, you know, uh, you, that's still, you need that uh, to help you get your footing on the road, right? And to figure out what, you, you know, what its value is, right? If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, we all need a touch point, right? Yeah. To go to go, wow, this is getting it's eliciting a response from people that they wouldn't normally elicit if if it wasn't good. Right. So you need uh, yeah, you need feedback. And I was getting it from the art teachers and eventually uh, uh, in high school, the art teacher would essentially just not even have me do the projects. She would just let me go, which and she was giving me that treatment alone. Not everyone had that. And, uh, you know, I was really inspired by like Salvador Dali, you know, and I was really getting into the surrealists, right? And I couldn't find, uh, you know, growing up in East Los Angeles, you don't get help. Uh, you know, you, you have no help outside of the family to your family. Uh, Mex growing up as a Mexican family, you don't get a lot of help to exit the family. You, you're held in, right? That's the way yeah. these cultures work. They're very codependent. They keep you close. And so uh, it's a difficult thing to explain uh, and to help uh, people understand that didn't grow up that way. I mean, I'm first generation American. We were talking about this. My family is from Mexico. I am very Mexican, even though I might not seem that way. Uh, I am the first one born here, the first generation born here, right? So when you look at a person that's very dark brown, that's me. But I'm in this color here, okay? It, it, and I speak English because my dad wanted me to speak English, okay? Uh, but I am just as Mexican as that guy. We are all, that is my experience in life, right? And you're limited. Uh, there's a codependence uh, in that culture that tries to keep you with the family. And they don't want you to kind of leave and go off, you know, and be uh, leave the family kind of a thing, you know? Uh, but I, I, I was that guy. I didn't care about any of that. And I went after, you know, trying to find all this stuff, Salvador Dali, oh, that's cool. You know, that's not part of my culture. Oh, you know, the Europeans, man, let's go check the Europeans out. You know, and, and I fell in love with the Europeans, man. Once I opened that door, uh, man, it was, okay, I'll see you guys later. I'm gone. <laughs> so you mean like, are you talking like Rembrandt, the Impressionist, Dali, yeah, all, everything? All, all the Europeans, man. And I fell in love with Daumier uh, because of the, his drawing, uh, you know, uh, was so fluid. You know, his hand, his drawing hand, he was able to express a lot with uh, just a, a line drawing, you know. Um, very simple uh, drawings and they were beautiful. And uh, Dolly, uh, I, it was like being stoned without being stoned, you know. Um, and, but there was a lot being said there, uh, you know. And I was, of course, into like we were talking earlier. I was into the uh, the whole monster movie culture too. All that came together when I left high school, and it was all coming together and becoming like this vibrating, you know, nut 
you know, of information inside of my head. By the time I left high school, it was there and it was living now. Uh, and I tried the rock band thing for a couple years still because uh, I had good friends still from high school. But then, you know, I realized that I didn't like working in a group. I just didn't like it. I wanted to be creative, but not in a group of people because they weren't going to move the way that I felt we should be moving. And since I wasn't playing the music, I was a drummer. I needed to leave, you know. And uh, I was an average, pretty good drummer, but I wasn't good enough to be the guy that everyone sought out. Uh, so it wasn't my thing. I needed to go and be creative on my own. And that was drawing and sculpting. And I had no idea how I was going to do that. You know, I had no idea. You know, the lectures from my dad were like, what makes you think when all the people in the world are, want to do the very thing that you want to do, that you're going to be the guy? Yeah. And I said, I don't know, but I'm going to do it. I don't know. You know, I have no idea, but I'm going to be that guy. And so are you, are you, are you kind of naturally like, like, are you, are you a determined guy or are you a contrarian or like, cause that would destroy some people to have their dad come at them like that. Right. Yeah. You know, my dad's a very strong character. Yeah. The thing is he could talk to me very freely because I'm equally as strong. Okay. Uh, personality just born that way. Yeah. Uh, when he told me that, I thought, ah, so you're telling me I can't do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't get offended by the, the contrasts, you know what I mean? And people coming at me, even people arguing against me really hard. Uh, I don't, it's, I am not easily offended by people that way. Uh, and it might be because I grew up with a very strong father, mm -hmm. right? Very strong personality. I mean, there's, you know, there's family members that are afraid of him still, <laughs> you know, and he's in his 80s and he's, you know, he can't <laughs> see, you know, anymore, but, and he's still, but we have, a, I get along with very strong characters because I find that there's a lot of, usually a lot of substance behind that, uh, that wall, you know, when you cross somebody, and they're that strong when you cross over to the other side of that wall you usually find a lot of substance in that person and because they don't give friendship out that easily you know and i find that earning a friendship of that quality is very rewarding uh and i have that kind of friendship with my dad right uh he's a difficult person to get along with but you know i get along with him like no one else you know uh, He's a great man. In my head, that's what he is. He's a great man. I love him to death, right? Very tough person. But so when he told me that, I thought, okay, I'm going to do it, you know? And I know <laughs> I can, right? I just know. And I, would, I knew my hand was going to do whatever I wanted it to do. And it was going to do it. And, I, and it, you know, in my head, I knew my ideas were going to be good. I was going to study classical drawing. I wanted to bring classical drawing the classical drawing hand, but draw creatures in that way, I thought. That that loose kind of pontormo, uh, you know, like some of the Rembrandt, you know, etching, uh, uh, you know, ink wash drawings. I wanted that look, but with creatures, right? But I didn't even know if the job existed, but I knew I was gonna do that, okay? So when I first walked into the industry, there was no job like that, that existed. They didn't hire people to do that. There were people that had those jobs, right, throughout history, but they worked, uh, they were hired on just to do that one particular job, right? They weren't uh, the gut person that they went to all the time for that. There was no freelance artist that did that kind of work. That was, there was no job position for that, that, oh, he's a creature designer. There's none of that existed. Um, you have like the, um, you know, you have like all these, they were makeup artists, you know, um, except for the lady that designed the creature. Uh, I don't know what she did outside of that, you know? Yeah, I don't either. I know who you're talking Millicent, about, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah Mill Millicent, I forget her last name. Um, you know, fantastic design. I saw her drawing. I mean, one of the best creatures ever designed. Um, Millicent, you know, whatever, I forget her last name. But she, uh, she, uh, I don't know what she did outside of being the, doing that. She, I don't think she, I don't know if she ever designed another creature, you know? Uh, Bernie Wrightson uh, did some stuff for Ghostbusters. 
uh, and a couple other things. But he was a comic book artist. That's what he did. He was a comic right. book artist. And most of the people that did this kind of work were either makeup uh, artists or sculptors, right? And they would design their sculptures. They were the project manager of that particular character, right? So they just happened to draw in addition to doing the other things they did. I just wanted to go in and design the stuff. I wasn't a makeup artist. I had no aspiration to be a makeup artist. I did like sculpting equally to my drawing, but I wanted to keep sculpting for myself, to be perfectly honest. I wanted to just sculpt for myself. I didn't want to sculpt for the industry. Uh, I did want to draw, though, uh, because I could get a lot. I knew that I could draw really fast and come up with a lot of ideas um, fast on paper. And so I knew that uh, business-wise, I could make a good living, you know, because I could deliver a lot. And so you had a sense of this early on yeah. of, of who you were and what you could do and, yeah. and where you were going to, you kind of projected yourself uh, yeah. to where you would be too. Yeah. I knew that I was, when I walked in and I, and, and here's, it's going to sound egotistic, but egotistical, but I, when I walked in and I saw the stuff on the walls, I go, they need me here. All right. And it wasn't that I was being egotistical. It's just that I knew that I commanded drawing. And I was only going to get better, right? I wasn't my best yet. And I knew it's like, it's like if uh, I walked out of when I was being born and God asked me, do you want it all now up front? Or do you want to grow the, whole, the rest of your life? And I chose the second one. You know, I want to get little bits and I want to grow my entire life. I could be the guy that just shows up like Michelangelo and just show up. But, you know, then you're there. You know, it was never fun to get there because part of the fun of drawing is always discovering yourself and discovering new ways of doing things. And for me as a designer and having to, you know, push ideas out fast, right? Uh, part of the joy is actually trying to find new ways to do things uh, because once you know how to do it, then it can get boring really fast, you know, and for a creative, you can get to fall into depression even because there's no challenge anymore. Um, so I like the idea of growing and I'm always learning new ways to do things, trying different techniques for every job. Um, you know, so I'll get into that though when we get into that part, but uh, so yeah. So I knew that uh, I was looking at what they were doing. I go, they need someone here that's just devoted to drawing. There, there was a period of time before you were, I'm assuming, before you were at the shops where you went to, you, you, you had some education after high school, is that correct? Or did you just um, get going? You know what? I, I thought I would go the way of education uh, in yeah. art, and it, it didn't happen. Yeah. I, took a life, I took a life drawing class uh, at Art Center, and I met Michael Spooner, uh, who became a friend of mine immediately. Uh, he was the guy teaching this life drawing class that was at night, right? Uh, and I took a night class there. I, went to, uh, I first went to uh, like a junior college. And I took a couple art classes there, and it was, it was, it was nonsense to me. And the teachers there were so arrogant, you know. And they were dealing with a teenager who uh, had some skill and already had an ego. So that kind of a challenge just provoked me to be even more egotistical, and uh, dislike them very much. I mean, I just did not like any of them, and we would argue all the time. But there was one lady who taught watercolor. Uh, she knew how to handle me very well, um, and I actually really liked her quite a bit. Um, very nice lady. She was just one of those happy art teachers, you know, like the you know older white woman, and she was just all into art. She was an arty lady, right? And she was just this really sweet lady that just kind of pushed me, and, and I was experimenting with watercolor with her. She was awesome, okay? But so she got you. She got you, and then she was able to kind of bring you along. Yeah, she was a really nice lady. I really liked her a lot um, because she knew how to handle someone like me, which who was difficult. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I have to say, it, you know. Um, and uh, anyway, so I, I didn't like it. I made a lot of friends there, though. But then I went to I decided I was going to try real education. I went to UCLA because uh, I was able to get good grades in uh, college. I was taking the full load thinking I was going to go. I was taking high math. I was taking high English and, and art, and I was going to go to university. I thought, you know, tradition says you go get an education. I was going to go that way. I went to UCLA, saw the art program, 
and uh, realized that this is a joke. Uh, walked into their animation department. I was walked into their sculpture uh, department first, and I saw them playing around, kids just trying to get a grade. And I saw that, and I, I didn't want to be in that world where people are just trying to get grades, you know? And I saw the whole thing. I hated it all. I hated the structure. Um, I really did not like any of it at all. I went to Cal Arts to look around, and I loved it there. But I couldn't afford it. It was just too expensive. I wanted to get into and I really wanted to be an animator. Um, it's something that I love. I know how to animate, just trying it on my own. I animated on the movie Cool World in a couple of scenes, and I've never had an education for that. It's just something I love to do. I like to act out my characters uh, and then design them. You know, I, I stand up sometimes and I act out the walk, then I draw the character in a static position, but I want to imbue that life even in the static pose, right? Uh, so um, I love animation. I couldn't afford that, and there was no way I was going to ask my father for that kind of dough. So didn't go there. Um, I went to Art Center, and I go, okay, there's a lot of illustrators here. There's a lot of classical skill here. You know, Doug Skip Lipke uh, was there, uh, Malcolm Lipke now. His name was Doug, Doug Skip Lipke then. And he shortened his name to um, uh, Malcolm Lipke now. What, um, I'm not familiar with him. What is he? He's, he's a fine art painter. Okay. Uh, and his art, he was in school at the time. And he does a lot of kind of, now he does a lot of people making out, you know. But back then, <laughs> <laughs> you know, back, uh, you know, but back then he was painting ballerinas, you know. And his palette was like uh, unbelievable. And he's still a phenomenal artist now. Uh, uh -huh. But he does. He does a lot of people making out gross faces and stuff. Uh, and he found his niche, you know, to sell. Um, but uh, his stuff was there before I got there. And I saw a lot of his stuff and I was looking around at everyone. I go, okay, this place has a lot to offer. Uh, so I want to come here, you know. But the, the expense was insane, you know, back then. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous now. You know, forget about it. I wasn't going to ask my dad for that kind of dough either. Uh, so I decided to go uh, at night and take a life drawing class to see what it was like. And that's when I met uh, Michael, first class I took, right? And Mike and I just hit it off. He told me he worked in animation. I was like, dude, that's what I want to do, you know? So, so he, briefly, just for, for the audience, Michael, Michael is a mutual friend of ours. Um, Michael uh, is actually the first guest on the first episode of the Breakthrough Creative. So you can go back to episode one if you want to hear a little bit of Michael. Um, Michael Spooner. But, yeah. Michael Spooner. Uh, Mike and I hit it off right away. He, he invited me to lunch at Filmation. And I was just going there for lunch. But then I interviewed with uh, someone there that was handling some of the stock scenes. And I got a job as a runner, you know. and literally i i just that was my walk-in right there i got a job as a runner running scenes back and forth between the buildings and i sucked at it because all i wanted to do is go and hang out <laughs> with the artists okay i was terrible because i was not doing my job i was just going and hanging out with the artists and talking with all the artists right and i knew i could do what they do i just needed to learn the technical stuff that they all knew right and uh and they were really nice to me the guys all the artists were really nice um, uh, old Disney guys were there drawing environments and you know Mike just kind of you know he kind of like put me there he goes okay now let's see what you're gonna do and he just kind of stood back and he just watched me you know you know like zapping around everywhere <laughs> and you know what I was so terrible at that job I got fired okay but a year later <laughs> uh, a year later I walked back and I took an animation test uh, and I has to do with flying colors, but I took a layout test and they hired me as a layout artist, right? At Filmation. Um, but they wanted me to use the stock system that they had there, which was using old scenes, which meant that you weren't really drawing, you just had to manage uh, sequences really, right? And I wasn't very good at that. So I was actually fired from that job too. I was let go, uh, too much technical <laughs> stuff, right? So, <laughs> 
So I ended up getting a job uh, for him almost immediately uh, working uh, with a guy named Cosmo Anzalotti, uh, who was the guy that led the uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks, right? At uh, Ruby Spears, it was a sister company at Hanna-Barbera. And he hired me because he just loved the way I drew. And he hired me just for my drawing skill. And he goes, I want you to draw, Carlos. I want you to draw these, these, these Elvin and the chipmunk and just correct every layout and make it beautiful. <laughs> right? He was this super soft-spoken uh, New Yorker guy, right? And really sweet guy, just very nice. And he would set me right next to him in his office and he would give me the scenes and he would just have me draw the chipmunks. And I was competing with a lady named uh, uh, Susan Bagdasarian. They were the owners of the property. Susan could draw like an animal. I mean, that lady, I was competing with the levels of that lady. She could draw like no one else. Between her and another lady uh, named Louise Zingarelli, uh, who were, they were the artists over there. Those two women were the ones that I had to measure up to, okay? And it was a hell of a challenge because they, their drawing hands were glorious, okay? They just knew how to draw cartoons that looked like classical drawings from the Renaissance. And that was my, always my goal. It was in my head. And I just saw the way they drew. I go, okay, I, I, got, I got to be better than these ladies. I won't be because they know how to draw people in a way that I probably won't, I don't have an interest in that, but I am going to get this drawing hand that they have. And I was already kind of there, but not to the level that they were, man. I mean, they were phenomenal, right? This was great. I was, a, I was a person with a strong character that needed that kind of a challenge and that kind of a weight on me, right? To just let me know where I stand, right? And I love it, right? I loved it then. I love that still today, right? It's, it's more difficult as you get older because you don't find that anymore, right? Once you get to a certain age, there's no more weights because they're all younger than you, right? So it's, it's not measurable anymore. You measure downwards, you know? You don't measure up anymore. You know, you're looking down, it's like, oh, there's a bunch of younger guys that are really good, but, you know, you know, but so it was fun when you're younger because you can look up to people that were really great, right? So now you have to look sideways at your friends, you know, that are really doing stuff that, are, that is really great. And you can call them and tell them, you bastard, that's really good what you did. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I have friends that are very, very good at what they do, which is very good. You know, I love, uh, I love being around that. You know, it kicks you in the pads, kicks you in the teeth. Um, and you need that always to keep you going. I, I, I love, that's why I like to hang out with people that are really good at what, and it doesn't have anything to do with art, even just that they're good at what they do. Cause you, you kind of feel their devotion, you know, and it, 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 it's, it's, it's good. So um, anyway, so I had to measure up and I was drawing and I, I drew there for the entire uh, season and then realized, you know what, man? All right, I, I get it, but this is not what I want to do. I discovered that there was a way to design characters and that I could get paid for it. And I had no idea. I learned it within that year of working for Cosmo uh, at Ruby Spears on the, on the Chipmunks. So the following year, you know, after my dad helped me buy a car, you know, I bought this uh, 924 Porsche that worked for all of about a week, right? And then I had to keep on working it to keep it working, right? But, you know, <laughs> he said, all right, you're telling me you're going to, you're going to, you're paying for this car. I'm not paying for this car. I'm just going to help you bid on this car. And I'm like, okay. So they helped me bid on the car. I got the car. And then I told him, yeah, I have a job. Don't worry. It's starting Monday, right? And I didn't have a job. I had to act like I was going to work every day. I would get in the car, drive off to a park and sit there and draw, okay? Okay? Very funny story. And <laughs> I, so what happened was I went for an interview and I did get a job. You know, that was the, that was the, uh, I actually, this is when I first got hired for Cosmo, right? Was when I got that car. So I, you know, that's how that happened, yeah. I, I'm having to remember when all this, the timing is. So yeah, the car was, when I got the job with Cosmo, that was to meet that, you know, and say, see, Dad, I was in line. I had a job, you know. 
<laughs> but anyway, going back now, I, so I got a design job uh, after when I discovered that I, it was on the Ghostbusters. I went and interviewed. I I learned people's names. Uh, I learned them. I kept on calling. Uh, it was uh, it was Deke Entertainment, and I kept on calling them. And I learned everyone's name of whoever I was supposed to talk to. And so I finally just said, screw it, man. And I called up and I said, I called the lady. I learned the assistant's name, you know, whatever her name was, you know, and, and Stephanie, I think it was Stephanie. And I, and I, yeah, can I speak to Stephanie with Mike Dalliani? That was his name, right? And she goes, yeah. Come here, Sam. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, so I, I go, you know, can I talk to you? Mike? my eye is busy right now. And I kept on getting that a lot. I, okay. So you know what I did? I got my portfolio. I went in my car. I drove all the way out. You know, I was living in L.A. And I drove all the way out into, uh, it was uh, uh, Van Nuys. And I drove to the studio. I walked in and I just said, yeah, I have an appointment. Uh, I made it with Stephanie, with Mike Maliani, uh, her characters, you know, on, on Ghostbusters. And she goes, oh, so Mike came out. Oh, Carlos, you know, Stephanie must have forgotten. And he walked me right in. I had an interview. <laughs> <laughs> you made an interview for yourself. I made it because I wasn't going to sit around waiting for people to get back to me, man. Because... You know, that's one thing. Uh, yeah, no one will do anything for you. You got to go out there and get it. Yeah. And so I went out there and I pushed my way in uh, to that uh, interview. And then he brought in the French guys, right? The two French guys, and they speak French. And I know them both pretty well. They, one of them became a boss kind of mentor to me later on. But he, they were talking, you know, French over me and looking at my portfolio. I could tell they liked it. And so... Uh, you know, I, I got hired, man. Uh, I went in for another interview and they hired me, you know, and back then, you know, they're going to pay me $300 a week. I mean, that was insane money for me back then. $300 a week? What, to sit here and draw creatures, characters? Are you kidding me? I mean, this and is again, no this mo- was for, this was Deke for the real Ghostbusters animated yes. series, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So you understand, I mean, uh, I was making no money when I was making that kind of money. I'd get home, you know, and go to my friend. Dude, we're going to McDonald's. Let's go. It's on me. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I just looked at the guy and go, you're going to pay me $300. All right. That sounds pretty good. You know, I'll do it. And I was smiling at my, I couldn't believe how much money they were paying me. I mean, this is back then. There's no money now. Right. Right. You can't make a living on that now. But, so every time it went up, it's, they were offering me the money, you know, they were offering me money. And I just looked at them. You're going to pay me that much to just sit here and draw stuff. This is unbelievable. So once that was it though, once I got in as a designer, that was it. I never went and did anything else. Once I got that first job as a designer working on the Ghostbusters, I was a designer from that point on creature designer, character designer, right? Working on the animated series for, you know, about eight-ish years, you know? But within those eight years, I was already peeking in uh, to film, little by little. People would call me and, you know, I would design things here and there, uh, and people were getting to know me at the later end of that, you know? How old were you around this time of life? Uh, in my early 20s. Okay. I started at 21. So you were good. I mean, yeah, you were, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got in at 21 as a designer, yeah. Uh, oh, 22, really, as a designer, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, yeah. I, I mean, honestly, I was very, very forward driven. I had a lot of opposition, which just made me have to push stronger against it with that much opposition, which made my legs really strong. My art legs, if you, you know, uh, I was going to push hard. Um, and I did, you know. And I had a vision in my head. I would literally have, uh, I would have waking ideas. I mean, you know, this, I was a kid. I wouldn't go to sleep without imagining something that I hadn't seen. Do you understand? I was a weird kid. I would sit there and imagine stuff. <laughs> and I, I couldn't go to sleep unless I imagined something lying in bed that I hadn't seen. And then I would go to sleep with that in my memory. And I wanted that swimming around, you know? It didn't matter what it was. I just wanted, even if it was an explosion of, you know, meteors that had beautiful color to it or, you know, form that I would, I would sit and stare at in my head, you know? Um, so you were using really power of visualization in your imagination to, to 
It's almost like uh, uh, imaginative plyometrics, right? <laughs> you're, you're strengthening your imaginative muscles by doing no, that. No, you, you really were. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, you, that's why it's important, even with clients today, you know what I mean? Uh, I, uh, I tell them, I, well, I'm going to need to daydream about that for a bit. You know, I need to go off. And that is work. I need to go off, you know, have a drink or whatever, hang out with my wife, you know, and just sit there and stare out for a while and think about this. And it, it, it's uh, really important for me if I get the clients to give me the job even a week ahead before I start drawing um, to sit uh, with it. Because if I'm just giving you my first impression, there's no difference between me and say a younger kid that's just gonna throw out whatever he wants. Uh, but what you get from me is when I daydream, because I daydream better than anybody, you know what I mean? I can sit there and stare at stuff and pull something out of the edge of a leaf and go, I have the theme for the entire project. You know, I know what to do here. And I need that. If once I have that, if I have that, then the project can turn into something that I will not even look at my own work. I'll just stay here drawing on their project day and night, which the current, the project that I'm working on right now that I can't even talk about is one of those. It's one of those kind of projects that is equal to Prometheus and Covenant, but nothing like them in that, like the movie, the first movie, it, it won, right? Uh, where I was allowed to go and I just immersed myself and I wasn't working on anything but that my mind was there in that, and it's just, uh, I was consumed by the shapes and the language for that particular project. I'm in one of those right now, um, which when you have them and you can acknowledge where you're at, it's one of the funnest things ever because they don't come along that often. You know, A Men in Black, the first one was one of those, you know, um, and you know, then there was a lot of space in between there. Just projects that I was working on that I tried to get there but couldn't because opposition or, you know, working with VFX people, <laughs> you know what I mean? VFX people always step in and they have their ideas and they want to tell you what to do. And they're trying to make you do that. That's when they destroy. When that happens, they destroy that theme, you know, that, that area of creative space that could turn into something really interesting. Uh, it's abstract, this kind of talk. Um, well, if I, if I can, tell me if this sounds familiar to you, if this is the vein, but I've been in, and my background is conceptual design for product and toys right. and whatnot. And we would dream something up and there would be buy-in from management and then you have to make it real. And then that's where you have financial limitations, you have engineering limitations, or you have the limitation of the engineer you're working with. Right. So what I found is, is I, I needed to know as much as I could about engineering and plastics and whatnot so that I could, I could spin what we could do. I could kind of argue and, and be an advocate for the design. Right. Yeah. And for it to make sense that, and for it to, for you to be able to come up with an idea and not have it uh, um, compromised, right. you know, and you want to be able to present ideas that actually are, this is not nonsense. I'm not just some art guy coming up with, you know, I'm not pulling things down from nowhere. All this stuff can work. Um, and that's the other thing is that uh, being, having had to work in the practical world where things have to get made either for animation which has major limitations uh, designing for uh, an animated 2D show, right? Um, I loved doing that, by the way, because of the limitations, because you had to be a great designer in how you assembled all those limitations for whatever crazy character that you were coming up with. So you have a limitation. You can't have any floating lines, you know, or you can only, but you can only have this many, you know, uh, and, you know, all that kind of, dis those limitations are really fun to play around with, right? In film, uh, there, and for, by the way, yeah. if I may, so those limitations are limitations of design, 
right? Because right. it's got it can't look foreign to the to the actual art artistry of the design of the show. Um, there are limitations of budget, right? Right, right? And limitations yes. of technology. Right. There's a lot of things that you need to be right. able to to play the game with those limitations. No, no, exactly. Those are yeah. Those are all separate limitations. Yeah, you have, uh, but usually uh, designing, uh, say for two D. Uh, the action is what will be limited more than the actual um, asset, you know, because there's not really, you know, if the character is going to do something, then you're asking for extra uh, guys to spend more time animating. So the character is only going to do this, you know, and they cut action out, right? But you can design a character that ha look as interesting as you want, but the everything that you're designing which is not just the actual asset, right? The actual character. It's what he does, right? You're uh, designing the personality also of who this character is. And sometimes, uh, you know, uh, most of that gets cut, up, cut out. So the character is not, uh, you know, is diminished. So it's not what you imagined at all. It's only, you know, 3% sometimes, you know? And, you know, what are you going to do? You just say, okay. Right. I mean, I have this in my portfolio. You know, I can show this off. I'm going to show off what he is supposed to do. You guys can go ahead and screw it up, but this is what I imagined it to do, right? Or not even screw it up. If you guys want to limit it, oh, fine. But I'm going to show off in my portfolio and show it to everyone what it should have been, right? In film, there's not necessarily that limitation, but for whatever reason, as it goes through the filters of VFX, you know, wanting to put their stamp on something by putting up a limitation so that their opinion and their job actually matters, you know, and they have to give an opinion and sometimes it's limiting the character, you know, and I should say most of the time it's limiting the character. And then you have, uh, you know, everybody, including the runner or the guy that goes and buys sandwiches coming in and giving opinions, you know, and <laughs> I'm not there for any of this. And they are all looking at what I did and saying, well, you know, and then they listen, you know, and then they forget about all the stuff that we came up with, all the rules, and it goes through and it's changed. And now all the rules that we designed for the character are thrown out because they just took out a huge chunk. And so now the character is watered down. You know, I mean, this has happened on many big films that I've worked on, you know. I mean, it's quite a machine, the, the filmmaking industry. It's a, it's a big beast with a lot of pieces moving and a lot yeah. of people wanting to have their say. And, and oh, my goodness, I can't imagine. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it took me years to actually adjust to it because I still want to fight back, you know, and fight for uh, the integrity of the stuff that I'm giving them. But... Uh, it they're not they don't listen it doesn't matter you know so i just design the characters as well as i can come up with the ideas write them down and after the movie comes out i just sit, tell everybody look this is what i did and this is what i wanted to do so okay so now you're you're making this transition from animation into film into creature right. character right. design right. Right. and and so did you get hired on by a studio as uh, like as a full-time employee or what did what did that look like for you so so this is how it went i was working on the ghostbusters again right the last time that i worked on it and this time they hired me as the lead character designer right this is at their new digs that deke got which was in burbank right so are these like are these like yearly contracts or are they season contracts season, yeah they're seasonal for the okay. show right okay. and it usually lasted uh 13 weeks you know uh, depending on how many episodes uh the show was which was you know roughly uh eight to 13 episodes i think per so season. you're doing an episode a week yeah yeah right. it, it was i was drawing like an animal for yeah. those. it was insane right i'll get to i have any the robocop i was designing up to uh, which was the last show i did in LA An before. animated the animated, yeah, animated series right yeah the animated series before i left Los Angeles to go live up north. On that show, I was designing up to uh, 30 to 40 characters, 50 characters per episode per week. 
that was designing that many characters. Okay. Now that was that was, thrust upon you because that was the demand, or was it thrust upon you because you're Carlos Wante? It was thrust upon me because that was the show. Okay. And All it right. was it was to me that's a poorly written show. Yeah. Uh, it should have been written uh, better. Uh, you know, you're you have these many characters for every single episode. You're writing. Uh, you have people writing for the show that don't know how to write for animation. It didn't matter to me. I loved it, you know, because uh, I was just sitting there. I was a machine. Just, I mean, honestly, because you're just drawing, throwing it, throwing, and you're. Just, this is what you're doing all day. You walk in every day and you're drawing like you're roughing out like ten characters, and you have a guy helping you clean them up and throw a line on it, and you're art directing them at the same time that you're cleaning up some of them, and then you're doing more roughs, and you know, it. It was. It was a lot of fun. I was a young guy. I didn't mind, you know. Uh, so, but yeah, so Ghostbusters again. Uh, so I, I'm back on Ghostbusters, hired as the, uh, the lead on it, uh, about to get married. So uh, you understand, I had left the industry being a really, um, I was really put off by all the politics in the animation world. And I did. I, I left for years, like for a couple of years in there, um, and uh, didn't. I had no interest in going back because I hated the way people were to each other in the industry. It was brutal. I mean, people were would rat you out. It's kind of like the cancel culture is right now hmm. in the world, right? In the industry, though, it was already like that. Um, but it wasn't about petty things. They were trying, it was different stuff. They would falsely accuse you of weird little things. And they were trying to get rid of you because they were jealous. And it wasn't necessarily, I, it was one thing was against me where they accused me of cheating on an animation test because I did so well on it, right? And I thought to them, I go, and I looked at them uh, and it was really this. The, and I told them, I go, uh, I go, how could I cheat on the test? I would have to do the job. If I couldn't do the job, why would I cheat on something that would just expose me as, as a fraud? I, I don't understand. I don't understand the thinking. I, I didn't get it. And I wasn't going to get something that was going to take away from you guys. I was just going to be added to the pool. I, I didn't get, there was a lot of that, right? So it was, it was really it was, mercenary. Like you had to watch your back. Yeah. And um, it, I didn't like any of that. So I left. Okay. And then I was, I met this, this girl that I was about, and I fell in love with her and I was gonna marry her, that's all I knew, I didn't care. I was gonna marry her, I didn't have a job, I had nothing. And so I decided to, uh, I am going a long about way, I, I decided to embarrass myself by making work under my younger brother, who was a cook at this place, and I went in as a busboy. I needed to insult myself, right? To get my, my energy back up. And I did, but the thing is, I was never insulted because I, I don't have, I, I, I love my brother. I didn't care, you know, and I enjoyed the job because I was working with all the guys. I was speaking a lot of Spanish because all of them were, you know, either from they were from down south. So I got along with everybody, all the cooks, everybody really well. But I was getting married, and I needed to be practical. I go, all right. So wait, go. are you are you Sea Biscuit? Is that like your personality? <laughs> you got to kind of fall back in the race, and then, and then you take off. Yeah, I, I, maybe I was. I don't know. You're saying this. I don't know. So I saw what was going on, and I, I mean, uh, no. So I, I, uh, my, I was about to get married. I, uh, my, uh, and I had to be practical about it. So I decided to go back in, and I went in, interviewed for the Ghostbusters animated series, and they made me the lead. All right. And uh, I was in. That was it. I started again. Immediately after getting that job, one of the guys that uh, was uh, with me as a designer uh, worked at, a, uh, had a friend uh, who was an illustrator at this place that designed uh, the, and uh, uh, designed dinosaurs off of the bones for museums around the world. And they built animatronic dinosaurs, full scale, right? And uh, he invited me to go and meet his friend, his friend, famous illustrator, uh, Miles Tevis, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I went there and uh, Miles had already left. And my, uh, another guy that was there, Jose Fernandez, right? Yeah. Uh, they were both sculptors there. And I walked in and I was immediately challenged. 
by the scale at what these guys were working at. And Miles' stuff there was um, beyond me. Do you understand? I saw the level of sculpting there that I just said, all right, I can't let anyone see my face. You know, this is beyond me. This guy is unbelievable, man. And then they showed me his drawings and I say, damn, he's this good at drawing too? Okay, I have to get better. Okay. So I just went in to meet everybody there. And then they wanted to hire me as an illustrator. But I had just gotten hired on at the Ghostbusters. And I had been working there for like a couple months, you know. Uh, and they wanted to meet, hire me as an illustrator at this place, Dynamation. And so I said, yes, you know. But I went back to Ghostbusters and I told them, hey, can I, would you guys let me work at home because I got another job doing this and I can't say no. And they said, yeah, no problem. So they let me work at home. So I, as soon, I, just before I'm getting married, I'm double booked, right? And, uh, you know, I got married, you know, and I was able to uh, fund us easily, you know, immediately. Uh, and uh, so I'm double booked. My wife is getting used to immediately straight out of the gate, my work ethic. I'm working. As soon as I get home, I'm working, you know, and she is exposed to that and has no problem with it, you know, okay? She likes it. She likes that I'm into something. She, you know, because I would take time out no matter what. Let's go for a walk. All right, cool. Hey, you want to go here? Yeah, let's go. I'll drive her here. Oh, yeah, no problem. I'll just come and do this later. I'll work myself into the evening if I can spend time with her during the day. You know what I mean? I, and I've been that way. I mean, I'm in my, you know, past my mid 50s now. So I've been doing this since then. And, and it's just, that was a beginning of what was be, what would become my way of um, my method. You know what I mean? So my, you had the margin to, to, to make room for life. Yeah. Um, it's a schedule when a lot of people are nine yeah. to five or, you know, you yeah. can go six to, to eight, right? If you're commuting or whatever. So you were, you were tasting a little bit of freedom in a way that is like working for yourself. Yeah. It is actually really similar to working for yourself. And, um, you know, and it was, it was cool. I mean, I have to say, you know, I know it sounds like, uh, you know, you have to know that you're good at something, right. In order to pursue it as uh, aggressively as like I did. Right. But it wasn't that you, and I use the word egotistical, right. A lot, but the truth is that I was very humbled by the fact that I was able to do this for a living, you know, um, and that I had the gift to do it. But I was also, I knew what I had and uh, still do, right? And I knew enough to go after particular things very aggressively. And so I did. And that's why I was confident enough that they would say yes when I walked into Ghostbusters and asked them if they would let me work at home. And they were cool with that. And, well, um, and you had a relationship with them and they knew what you could do. And yeah. so I'm, I'm sure there was some familiarity there with you and they were like, yeah, cool, man. Yeah. They were very nice to me. They were really nice to me. Um, um, and that, you know, upon, you know, and one of the big things that it's like, I didn't even talk about, we didn't talk about is that just walking in, you know, before all this happened is when I had just, uh, uh, converted I, I had an experience with god and became a christian at this time you know uh and it was i was about 24 you know when all this happened was when i was dating what we, the, my wife when we were dating you know and yeah. so we started our lives i mean she had been a christian her entire life right but um i came in you know at 24 you know uh and i uh it was something that I had been running after, and I didn't realize that until then, you know, that I had been chasing my whole life, um, is wanting to know who God is, you know. And, and I wasn't interested in any secular kind of, you know, angles. I was interested in, you know, the Judeo-Christian uh, story because I had, and I, cause I knew how far back that went, you know. And so I knew I was on solid ground and I had already an interest, you know, I, you know, honestly, I had an interest in God my entire life, uh, but um, meeting, you know, God, the way that I did, you know, um, was something that completely changed my life. 
and took me out of Catholicism and religion altogether, you know, um, and found me in a relationship or trying to find that relationship. You know, that there's that scripture that you have now been given power to become a child of God, right? So there is a becoming, you know, that I, I was there, you know, and I, I received that, the gift, and now I'm in that pursuant, that pursuing, um, you know, uh, I hate to use the word journey, but, you know, I'm on that road, you know, uh, and I'm pursuing that relationship, you know. Um, anyway, so that That's a good I, road. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I am on that path, right? And to this day, right? And I've had that path, you know, me uh, ignore that path at times in my past and then come back even stronger, right? And I'm in that place right now, right? Where I'm in that side where I went through a valley and I came out, you know, no matter my experience, because humanity is still here, you know, and it gets in the way. And sometimes the, you know, the body and the mind, you know, this thing that we wear uh, takes us <laughs> yeah, to places where you're like, what the heck am I doing? You know what I mean? Why yeah. am I? Yeah. You know, we're handled the back and I'm here, you know? Uh, so all that to say that that happened in the midst of all this, there was a lot of stuff going on. Okay. So uh, I have a lot of charge and inspiration from the spirit of God dwelling there in me. You know what I mean? Uh, and it's never ending flame of fire, you know, that you get from that meeting, you know, um, and when you punch into that, right, there's like a happiness, right, that you get, that you can use for what you do, uh, which I do, right? Uh, I have, I do what I do as an expression uh, of what that is. And it does, it's not that it, what I'm doing is ministering and what it is, I'm drawing monsters and creatures, right? Uh, you know, I, I, for a long time, I couldn't talk about that in the church, you know? Mm. Uh, I, and I didn't want anyone to know because I think that people would religiously get uh, afraid and think that I was into something really dark. I'm not into anything dark. And people that are into dark arts think that because I draw monsters and stuff that I'm into that dark. I'm not, actually. The way that I look at this stuff is I'm just abstracting with form. And it happens, I'm making it functional for entertainment. That's all. So I am really just really interested in form and how the transitions from form to form go on either a human structure or how do I play with that human structure and push it out. I'm just being creative. That's all. Well, and it's a facet of storytelling too. You know, it's like anything. You can't, you can't yeah. have... Well, in drawing, right, or sculpting, even you can't right. have light without dark. In music, you right. can't have 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 you know light without dark. With music, right. you you right. it all plays together, and and there's form that happens from it, and um, you know that that's just a part of storytelling. I think I don't know. What do you think? No, no, you're right. Uh, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that uh, you know. So if you want the volume in the story you create, uh, you know, greater contrasts, right? And since my job is designing, usually drawing the villain, because the good guy is usually a human, right? Uh, I want to get as interesting as I possibly can to create the, you know, uh, the biggest threat that I can to uh, the hero of the story, right? Because I want the challenge to be, you know, overwhelming. I, wa I want that character to be uh to think he's gonna lose you know you've lost look at this but then he wins you know and that's good so that you know uh that's my job so i play in that world a lot <laughs> you know um but then you know i mean so i you know i create artwork for myself which deviates from but i use a lot of that stuff in my own artwork but i create a narrative also and i write the story in either a, a lyric you know, on the side. And so people can actually, you know, try to get into the abstract of what the image is that they're looking at by reading. And if they read slow enough, they'll get, they'll get immersed, uh, you know, into the image. Um, 
of in my book blind spot that's what that was about i was trying to bring people into the um that abstract of what that image you know you write that lyric and you want them to read it and then look at the image read it again look at the image and just kind of immerse yourself in what i'm trying to say here you know because it's not just the surface anyone can create a beautiful image i mean there's a thousand people there's like there's like there's millions of people i think out there now right i think there's you know you go to art station and uh, everyone on there is like phenomenal you know or you know deviant art there's a lot of phenomenal but they're all riffing off of each other you know and the narrative is lost i because they're just creating a bunch i mean beautiful imagery right to sell themselves. So, so let's let's look at that real fast because that's important if if you want to uh be uh uh, a gainfully employed, maybe that's not the way to put it. If you, if you want to be separate from, from all the work that's out there, you want to make a name for yourself. You really want to make an impact in your right. industry. How do you do that? Nowadays, very difficult because there's so many, like I was just talking about this. I, I mean, you just, you know, take that guy. That's it. Um, very few people have history uh, to brag about in this industry now, right? Um, the illustrators are all very young and they, worked, uh, they work strictly in 2D. Uh, or now some of them actually claim to be illustrators, but they're actually using 3D elements. And I see a lot of that. There's a yeah, lot of that. I, I'm not a fan of that at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't like it infecting, and I say infecting, the design uh, field either, because it's not a design tool. That's a production tool, right? You start making it. That means you're thinking, you know, about the way the thing looks in the round. You're already affecting the technical side, the issues, hmm. right? Right? You're already doing that, you know, because you're working in 3D and turning the thing around. You're, you've already lost feeling. The character is not, had, you're, uh, you're approaching it from a technical perspective. You're not just putting your emotions in and here, look at this guy, you know. You can't do that because that thing, you know, after I have the character, then, you know, you're going to put it in pose and now you're going to pose it. You know, you have a G.I. Joe for that. You know, I could have one, buy a G.I. Joe and put him in. Okay, I'll put clay on his head. Now he's got a helmet. Because, you know, what it turns out, most of those designs end up as men with fancy hands and fancy heads. That's it. There's nothing interesting there, right? Right. Because most of those guys that do that are very conservative in their heads. They don't have, uh, uh, they don't have an imagination. They're just pulling things from what they've seen yeah. uh, and using it in their 3D little dolls that they make, you know, which, hey man, I love it but not for that part of the, uh, um, you know, that part of the project. I mean, that part should be all 2D. I mean, I honestly think it should be uh, start off in on paper and uh, just line drawings, people and communication back and forth. Here, let's get going. Oh yeah, now let's start working them up a little bit. You know, too much has been cut out of the process, you know, and the, now they want to see everything in color, on, I mean, immediately, you know. Um, that's a lot of work to yeah, put that's out. That's quite a jump to jump right to color. I mean, it's yeah. got no room to breathe. No. Uh, so, you know, I tend to work monochromatic um, at the beginning and add just one hint of color somewhere. Yeah. And then I, I tell them, I go, look, I haven't even looked at color yet because that's going to be a whole other animal altogether. Is that, uh, you, it looks like you work pretty small. Do you, well, is that, is that typical or is that just your books, your sketchbooks? That's just the sketchbooks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, the movie, it was the first movie I did in a sketchbook. Prior to that, I was working 14 by 17. Okay. You know, it was on a good size piece of paper. Right. And the drawings were 14 by 17. I wasn't drawing small on the paper. I was yeah. drawing big, you know, yeah. Harry uh, big. Yeah. Yeah. I was drawing big. Yeah. So, uh, the but it got me uh working small uh i don't know why i did that i just did 
I wanted to try it and I did and it worked really well. Yeah. And I, and I used uh, some methods that I had experimented in my early twenties. I was able to finally use them in my forties, you know, and pull them out and all right, you know what? Yeah, let me try that. You know, I'm going to start doing this, uh, you know, and see if it works. And it did, you know, it was one of the best jobs I ever had, you know, and one of the, the you know, the funnest times I've ever had on a project was the first it movie. First, yeah. it, it was, it was a good time. So I think something that would be interesting to to touch on would be the relationship you have with the director. Now, I, I I gather at times it's kind of brief and maybe distant, but it sounded like on it, you were you were pretty close with the director. Um, you know, I just got uh, one word from Andy on the first movie. Go. That's it. Uh, and then the VFX guy was there telling me what he liked and didn't like. But there was no didn't like, just it was all keep going. So at a certain point, I thought of doing production level drawings, right? Um, because I was just sketching, just uh, they were all feeling drawings, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they didn't like that. They didn't want me to go production. They go, no, 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 no. Can you just do what you were doing before? And I said, all right, sure, I'll do that. And I, I did. I just, and that's all I did for the film. That, that uh, it was just drawing, uh, and uh, my the feeling for the moment of that character and what, and I was, in the, there was the design was there, but it was uh, more about you know, an emotional kind of hit with this crazy image. Um, well, and that's interesting that you say that because we, we you were just talking a lot about that, about how that seems to be lacking yeah. in, in, in much of uh, the development of a visual. And yeah. the director was kind of clear with you. It's like, let's, or the VFX guy is like, let's just keep it here. Like we want it, we like this raw motion here. Yeah, they and they kept me there. And I, man, this made it one of the funnest things I've yeah. ever done, you know? Very Dore, I mean, like, in, in, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was very much in the world because Dory uh, is a huge inspiration uh, to me uh, yeah. because not just because of the way he drew and what he drew. Right. Um, but it is because of that, but also because of what he did in, in that he was able to make a book of his artwork by the time he was 35. And that is exactly the age I was when I did Monstro. Right. Yeah, and he and he was a huge inspiration. Tell us about Monstro. Um, yeah, my first book. Just since right? you brought Monstro. it up, yeah. Yeah, Monstro, my first book. I had a, an idea to do that book uh, from my early twenties, right? Because uh, growing up and being a creature guy, there was none of that for me. The only book that I had growing up was Fairies, right, with Alan Lee, and um, and you know. And, um, Is that Froud? Yeah, Brian Froud, yeah. Yeah. And, but I was a huge Ellen Lee fan. I just Yeah, his stuff is you know, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I just I just, you know, I I couldn't take my eyes off all his stuff. And um you know, nothing taken away from Brian Froud at all. Right. Uh, I love I love his stuff. But yeah, I Brian just, Froud is like the dark crystal for the audience who doesn't know. And then uh Alan Lee, uh, a lot of his uh production work was used in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and also uh he did a lot of watercolors for Lord of the Rings prior to the films. Right. Uh, for just for the stories. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he was that guy already. Yeah. So, uh, and one of the best in the world, like uh, ever to do any of that stuff, still untouchable. Right. Um, so a uh, huge fan. Uh, and uh, that was the book that was a model for me also. And uh, so I wanted to do something like that, you know, um, and I, it would, but I wanted to do it of uh, monsters that were for film, you know, not fantasy, which was very European, you know, fairies. That's very European. American is the American monster movies, like, you know, the classics and all that, you know, the Wolfman and, you know, but, and Frankenstein's monster, the mummy and all. I wanted to do something that had that in it, but from the way, from the stuff that I grew up with uh, in the seventies, you know, and, uh, and the sixties, I, of course I was watching old stuff, you know, and then the eighties, you know, happened 
and you know you have you know all these great you know movies like you know predator you know robocop and you know the thing alien i mean forget about it you know i mean all this really great stuff coming out you know uh late 70s early 80s and stuff so i wanted to put a book together of that kind of stuff you know for people that were younger than me that uh would so they would have it because i didn't have it if there if there are artists out there who who want to follow in in this path this kind of creature design path or even animation you've talked a lot about your drawing skills and your commitment to that right um what what kind of advice would you give somebody who's who's interested in pursuing this career it requires a lot of devotion and work uh a lot of work and you have to uh find a um almost a vision of who you are and you have to hold on to that just i mean against all uh opposition and uh you have to know who you are and you have to but you have to be able to make it happen so you have to devote yourself and you're it's like making a sword you have to sit there and hammer yourself out and make yourself what you see yourself as uh and you, you and it's just like hammering that steel and it gets all hot you know, it has to be glowing. You have to, um, you know, be able to take it. What are, it's what, a lot which, what, of work. I'm sorry. I, I was going to ask, what are some real world um, actions somebody can take to hammer okay. themselves into shape? Yeah, so that's the attitude. So practical things. Uh, drawing from your imagination, okay? If that's what you want to be, then you have to be able to do that. Don't show me a lot of life drawing. I don't really care. If you show me your portfolio and there's a lot of life drawn in there, I'm going to look at you. Yes. Yeah, so what? So you can draw the figure really well. I don't care. Show me what you have to offer. And the, the, what you have to offer is your, what's inside of your head on paper. And if, if that's good, then you are that guy or girl, whatever, you know what I mean? Um, you are that person. Okay. Uh, if you can't do that, don't fool yourself. You may have artistic skills that actually you'll be happier doing something else instead of trying to suffer through something, uh, through the, you know, trying to make yourself something that you are not. Um, and one of the things that you have to be able uh, to do is to look at who you are and uh, to assess that uh, from outside of yourself and look, well, what do you judge this person as? You know, are they really who they say they are? They're not. And then maybe you're a model maker. I mean, maybe you're a modeler. Maybe you're an environment artist, not a character designer. But whatever you're going to do, you should be able to do that, you know, outside of school. School's not going to give you that skill, right? If you can do it already and you have an inclination towards something, do that. Go towards that. Everyone wants to be the lead guitar player, but not everybody is, right? Maybe you're the drummer, and maybe you're really good at playing those drums. And you will be equal to any lead guitar player on those drums. You'll be a, unbelievable, right? Maybe you'll be singing. Neil yeah. Pert. Neil Pert. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Stuart Copeland, Neil Pert, you know, I mean, you go all those rock guys, right? Back in the day that we grew up with, um, you know, uh, so pursue, you have to be very sober minded about who you are and not, uh, you know, uh, living in a fantasy. Uh, you have to be practical and it, you know, you'll have a happier life. I think if you are doing what you're actually good at rather than trying to make yourself something that you are not. Um, if you do that, then you're going to be fighting your whole life. You're going to be miserable and you're going to be angry at everybody for not getting who you are. When the truth is you're not getting who you are, you know, you're not getting it. You're not that person. You know, you're not that person. Don't get angry and don't blame them and start, you know, accusing people of stuff just because you're not good at it. You know, you have to be sober minded about it. Be honest and you'll be happy. I mean, I've seen people that were, uh, that realized that they were modelers and you know what? They are phenomenal modelers, CG modelers. Uh, and they're not designers. They know it. But when they, you give them something to do, man, they're really good. I mean, and they're, they're priceless. You can't put a price on a, a really good modeler. Uh, you can't because they're going to help you see your vision through. 
you know, uh, for the artist. So um, everybody is valuable in the process. Uh, you can't think of yourself less than because you weren't that guy that you thought you were or person. Okay, don't get mad at me. Um, and if you want to, uh, you know, um, whatever. It's, so anyway, there it is. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks for being my guest. I'm looking forward to picking it up again. Yeah. And uh, I feel like I got a brother. So it's very, very <laughs> cool. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks, man. It was a real pleasure meeting you, man. Likewise. Okay. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. So that was my interview with Carlos. Carlos, I want to thank you so much for being on The Breakthrough Creative. What an awesome insight into your career. It was funny because Carlos and I probably spoke for about 45 minutes before we even got into the interview. And it, it was just, uh, it was really cool. And I was like, hey, hang on, stop. We've got to record this stuff. So let's let's hit record and get going. And we did that. Now, if I were to, you know, put a, a, a spotlight onto a few of Carlos's attributes that have made him successful and that maybe we really need to take a good look at. The first one would be that Carlos had a, a, a desire and an interest and a direction and he committed to it. I was talking about that in last week's episode that we need to, to commit to something and we need to get after it. And man, does Carlos have a lot of get after it in him. I, I just love that he kind of forced himself into uh, a corner. I know he didn't say that, but it sure seems like that's a, a part of his story that that he said, hey, I'm just going to do this. And, you know, he had the talk with his dad and that really, you know, lit a fire under him to stubbornly commit to going after uh, work in the animation industry to start, right? Uh, where he would be drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing. And uh, once he kind of got a foot in the door in the animation world and he knew he wanted to work at some particular places, uh, he left no stone unturned and found his way in. And sometimes you're not going to get in through LinkedIn or you're not going to get in through somebody you know. Sometimes you have to be clever and creative and find a way to get to the front of the line and to get in, to put yourself in a position where you can get that job. And then the, the other thing that I would spotlight with, with Carlos is, is that he is a very confident in his abilities and in his competency. And I think nowadays we might be a little bit shy to, to express how confident we are in our abilities because we're afraid that we're going to come across as cocky or full of ourselves. And if we can frame what it is that we do in a manner that is true, like, hey, I'm a pretty good airbrush artist. I'm, I'm a successful airbrush artist. I, I'm skilled at it. And I like to use my airbrush skills to uh, help clients get to where they need to get to with the airbrush. So I don't have any problems expressing to someone that I know my way around an airbrush. And if I do it in a way that is uh, a direct and true, I can't really help if somebody thinks I am cocky or full of myself, but I, I'm not. I just know what I, it is that I'm doing. And I, I think, you know, Carlos uh, obviously has that uh, same attribute. So I would encourage you to take a look at what it is that, that you do well and to really take an objective look at yourself and say, hey, I'm actually pretty good at this. And that's going to help you uh, to ascend in, in your craft and in your business. And uh, I think that that's something really important because there aren't a lot of people who are going to look out for you if you're not going to look out for yourself. You don't need to throw anyone under the bus. You don't need to be a jerk about it. But what you can do is, is say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. I want to help you. Let me in. Let me do this for you. 
And it's amazing uh, what can happen when you go after things with that kind of an attitude. Uh, if you want to find out more about Carlos, you can go uh, to Instagram and you can find uh, Carlos at uh, Gallery and a Tom, or you can find him uh, at Carlos underscore Wante, H U A N T E. Uh, you can go find him on Patreon. And so that's patreon.com forward slash A N A T O M, Anatom again. And then you can go to his website. And I have that information in the show notes. So you will be able to see Carlos's work there. Uh, I'm hoping to have him back. Uh, I'd like to hear more about his work in practical effects and then his work in, more in the visual effects world and then maybe even get a little insight into him working on a project with a director. Uh, so that's it for this week. And next week, my guest is going to be Ted Haynes. Ted Haynes, you can find him on Instagram. He is known as Foam Faber, F-O-A-M-F-A-B-B-E-R, Foam Faber. Uh, Ted uh, is a Foam Faber in the effects industry. That's not all that he does, but that kind of became what he was known for. He works with uh, upholstery foam to shape out muscle suits, uh, creature suits, fat suits, and he has worked on uh, superhero movies like The Avengers, and he has worked on old-timey practical effects movies as well. He's got quite a, a story and a journey and I'm really, really looking forward to you hearing his story as well. So for now, I'm John at The Breakthrough Creative. If you like this show on YouTube, would you please subscribe? And if you're listening on the podcast, would you also please subscribe? And then if you're on Apple, iTunes, if you would leave us a five-star rating. If you believe it's a five-star, please do. If you don't, just leave it blank. Don't do that. But if you'd leave us a review, that would be awesome because that really helps to uh, get us noticed and it helps to uh, share the message here, which is that you can uh, work as a professional creative in a way that uh, really matches up your skills with your dreams, okay? And you can email me at john at thebreakthroughcreative.com, and I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts, your comments, your suggestions. How can we make the show better? Who would you like to see on the show? And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. And I know I have a special subscriber in Belgium, and I don't know who you are. I just know that you download the show in Belgium, and I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear what you think of the show, and I'd just like to get to know you. So... Uh, with that being said, this is the Breakthrough Creative, where we talk about the business of art and the art of business. And I'd encourage you to go figure out how to make a living from what it is that you love to do. See you next time.